Napoleon. You might have heard of a few battles, Trafalgar, Waterloo, but how did Napoleon find the funds to pay for soldiers and ships on such a global scale over two decades across 330,000 square miles? After the French Revolution, France's economy was in dire straits and it kept getting worse. During the tail end of the War of the First Coalition in 1796, Napoleon took command of the Army d'Italie. Napoleon was given free reign to plunder all of southern Europe. The government's only request was that he finance the fighting himself. Napoleon's army consisted of 60 cannons, a few horses, and only 30,000 men. Some didn't have shoes or uniforms, and no one was getting paid. Napoleon told his division, Soldiers, you are naked, ill-fed, but rich provinces and great towns will soon be in your power, and in them you will find honor, glory, and wealth. Napoleon funded his first major campaign by promising his soldiers loot, and loot they did. After the victory at the Battle of Montenote, and then capturing all of northern Italy, thousands of churches were emptied of their contents. Over 30,000 paintings were stolen from Venice alone. From 1797 to 1799, he marched into southern Italy, victory after victory against the Papal States. Works of art, religious vessels of gold and silver, were all liberated. Napoleon even raided the Vatican's treasury. On a small regional scale, the looting worked. The Italian campaign surprisingly did pay for itself. Soldiers did receive some pay and all the loot they could carry, while Napoleon transferred much of the wealth to himself in Paris. But would the looting work on a grand scale? Napoleon ascended to the position of first consul in December of 1799, which essentially meant, well, let's just say he made himself emperor. The emperor of an insolvent and broke republic. But having little funds didn't stop Napoleon from crossing the Alps, spending a year chasing the Austrians out of Italy, and starting the Napoleonic Wars, which lasted from 1800 to 1815. Once emperor, Napoleon took control of every aspect of his realm, including its finances. Campaign administrators kept precise records of property seized. Accounts labeled soldiers and equipment as costs, plunder as revenue. Separate accounts were even kept for each campaign. Napoleon insisted on knowing the profitability of each victory. He wrote to Count Nicolas Francois Moulin after the Battle of Wagram in 1809, I did not make as much from this campaign as I did from the last. Napoleon demanded to Jean de Dieu Soult, one of his marshals of the empire, you must make it your guiding principle that the war must feed the war. Was it even possible? Did war pay for war? How did he pay his troops? It all started with ordinary contributions. Once Napoleon's troops entered enemy territory, public finances were seized, all taxes were confiscated. French army wages were dependent on occupied countries' ability to pay. In wealthy regions, Germany, Prussia, and Austria, the military was well paid. In Poland, Russia, and Spain, there were constant struggles just to eat, let alone get paid. To save money, soldiers were paid at the very end of the campaign. Those who were injured were paid less. Those that were killed didn't get paid at all. Dead men don't need gold. There were ordinary contributions, and then there were extraordinary contributions. At the start of his reign, payments received from diplomatic treaties went towards balancing the imperial budget. The sale of Louisiana to the United States in 1803, the alliance with what would later be called the Kingdom of Italy in 1805, all brought hundreds of millions of francs to the French state. After the Battle of Austerlitz in December 1805, Napoleon changed the system. Diplomatic payments no longer were directed to the imperial budgets. An entity known as the Extraordinary Crown Domain was created. All rewards of war were to benefit only the army and to Napoleon himself. Each conquered city or state was assigned a contribution requirement commiserate with its wealth. This amount did not include the ordinary contributions already made, nor did it account for all the looting. It was just an extra tax for being conquered. Funds collected enabled Napoleon to erect monuments in Paris. Treaty fees were used to erect the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel and the Column in Place Vendôme, where before the funds were going to the Republic. When his armies were not at war, Napoleon exported his soldiers to squat in allied territories. Regiments were stationed in Italy and the Germanic states, not for military reasons, but so that those countries could pay and feed them. Napoleon's allies were also expected to provide troops. The Kingdom of Italy and Spain supplied soldiers, as did the Germanic states during the Prussian Campaign of 1806. 
The cost of maintaining these units, of course, fell upon their home country, no matter where they were stationed. Slightly less than half the costs incurred in the Napoleonic Wars were actually covered by the war. In other words, the war fell a long way short of paying its way in full. Why not just issue debt or devalue the franc? Revolutionary hyperinflation was a painful experience and was fresh in every Frenchman's mind. So Napoleon decreed that government debt was never to be more than 10% of total expenditures. Napoleon was also committed to metallism. Napoleon demanded that a third of French francs in circulation be backed by metals. Per an 1803 law, Napoleon tied the franc to both gold and silver. The French mint paid 200 francs for a kilo of silver and 3,100 francs for a kilo of gold. France's price guarantee ensured a stable exchange value of 15 and a half between silver and gold for decades. With restrictions on debt issuance and a dedication to sound money, how would Napoleon make up for any shortfall? One word, taxes. Martin Gaudin, Napoleon's minister of finance from 1799 to 1814, instituted la contribution foncier, or land tax. Gaudin conducted surveys in 1802 and 1807. The surveys assessed every inch of French farmland, placed a value on that land, and taxed it. This tax burden was thought to be more equitable. Owners could not escape the taxes. Three quarters of all new taxes were derived from this land tax. Napoleon's allies copied this administrative rigor to collecting taxes. In the Kingdom of Italy, for example, to pay for Napoleon's constant demands, Giuseppe Prina copied Godin, conducted surveys, and raised land taxes of his own. Prina, however, was murdered by the mob in 1814. However, this tax method survived in Europe for over a century. If you didn't work or own a farm, no problem. Napoleon created La Contribution Personnelle Mobilier, taxes on personal industrial incomes. This tax had an initial fixed sum, plus a variable amount based on external signs of wealth, like chimneys, or the number of servants employed. As his wars dragged on, Napoleon needed more and more money. He introduced taxes on playing cards, alcohol, and salt in 1809. In 1810, the French state created a monopoly on tobacco and taxed it. Tobacco taxes grew to a quarter of France's revenues by 1813, but it came at a huge price politically. The French hated the tobacco taxes, almost as much as being conscripted into the army. Napoleon's finances were not as memorable as his glorious battles or his romantic escapades. This newfound, data-driven, public finance state tax system outlasted Napoleon and impacted Europe for well over a century. The upside to this somewhat fiscally responsible system was that Napoleon was never fighting with creditors, bankers, or politicians. The empire never went bankrupt. He also never had to deal with the crushing burden of hyperinflation on the home front. Why was it a constant struggle to obtain funds? In the first place, conflicts were not confined to land battles. One third of military spending was for the Navy. Naval victories could not pay for themselves. You can't tax the sea like you can with land. Second, the campaigns never stopped. Constant conscription of fresh troops was needed, and there was always the need for replacement equipment. Thirdly, defeated powers were not always wealthy. Spain, Russia, and Austria were in a constant state of bankruptcy. Only one country was capable of providing the French Empire with enough money to cover the cost of its wars, and that was England. But Napoleon never reached London. France and England were the only two countries wealthy enough to withstand decades of war. April 1814 saw the fall of the French Empire. After Napoleon's first abdication, Europe went easy on France, and no reparations were demanded. After Waterloo, however, reparations were required. Under the Treaty of Paris in 1815, France was ordered to pay 700 million francs. This is the most expensive war reparation in proportion to GDP ever paid in history. That is, if you exclude the German World War I reparations, which Germany never actually paid. The 700 million franc fee, in the end, canceled out all the wealth obtained from taxes, looting, and Allied support during the wars. But Napoleon's France did pay its bill, primarily because Napoleon didn't bankrupt the nation of France during his reign. If he had, and nothing was left over, who knows how history would have changed. The Napoleonic Wars. All wars. Any war could not pay for itself. How could they? War is about death and destruction, not profit and loss.